Okay, so this is uh, Grace in the Book of Romans. That's the uh, title of our series. Uh, this is lesson number eight in that series. Uh, the name of this particular lesson, The Response of Grace, part five. We, we, we're doing lots of parts because the section entitled The Response of Grace in Romans uh, takes up a lot of, uh, takes up uh, many uh, passages. Today, the part five will be uh, from Romans uh, chapter six, verse one to uh, verse 14. So we continually need to kind of review here. You know, I keep adding a block and then adding another block of information, then adding another block of information. Uh, so we always need to review at the beginning uh, so that uh, the piece that I'm going to add this week will kind of make sense and fit uh, with uh, the material that we have been talking about. So, so far in our study of grace based on the book of Romans, we have seen the following. First of all, we see that God originally expressed His grace in creating the world and placing man at the head of it. Next, there came the rejection of grace. So man rejects God's grace and becomes trapped in a cycle of sin and death over which he has no power to free himself. The next thing that happens uh, that Paul writes about is that God renews his expression of grace by doing several things. First, he pays off man's moral debt through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then he offers man forgiveness and eternal life based on faith in Jesus Christ rather than offering him uh, forgiveness and eternal life based on perfect performance according to the principle of law. If you had to choose which way do you want to be saved, by faith in Christ or by perfect performance? Well, you know, if I were you, I would choose faith in Christ. Okay. Then, uh, after explaining these things, you know, original grace, rejection, response, after explaining these things, Paul answers four questions that might arise based on the text and based on what he has written so far. Four questions. Question number one, well, what about the law? Do we abolish the law when we accept salvation by faith? And his answer is no. Uh, what actually happens is we see the true purpose of the law. And the true purpose of the law is to reveal sin and bring men to the point where they ask for God's mercy. That's the purpose of the law. Another question, well, what about Abraham? Was he not justified by obedience to God? And the answer to that was no. He was considered righteous because he believed. His obedience was never perfect, but it was motivated by what he believed. And because of that, he was considered righteous by God. Question number three. Well, what does this system accomplish for me? You know, does it give me what I had before? Answer, well, it not only gives you what you had before, it gives you more than that. Before, through the law, you only had the knowledge of sin and death. And through the prophets, you had a promise of hope in the future. That's what you had before. Now, Paul tells them with Christ, they have the fulfillment of the promises. And what are the fulfillment of the promises? Well, they have peace with God, joy with God, love of God, safety from the judgment of God, reconciliation with God, eternal life with God. These are all the things that you now have. So are you better off than you were before? Absolutely. All right, so today we're going to study the answer to the final question that is posed. It's not posed in the text, remember? These are hypothetical questions that, you know, like a straw man, you know, that Paul is kind of answering uh, because he is, he's imagining what questions people would have based on what he's written so far. So he's going to answer another question, and the question is, if compliance to rules cannot save me, why then should I even try? Good question. So Paul asks this particular question two times. In verse one of chapter six and in verse 15 of chapter six, he asks the same question twice. 
and he answers it in two different ways. One time and from verses two to 14 and then the next time verses 16 to 23. So basically the question is, well, what about sin and grace? How do we, how do we balance these two ideas? You know, if I'm not saved by perfect rule keeping, why should I even try to keep the rules? Okay. So he begins with a historical answer, right? Verses one to 14. So let's read uh, verse one, Romans six, verse one. What shall we say then, Paul says hypothetically, are we to continue in sin so that grace might increase? So here's what, the, here's what this question you know, is suggesting. If grace is always bigger than my sin, why not continue to sin in order to generate more of God's grace? In other words, why not just relax, enjoy sin, because after all, if grace is bigger than sin, no matter what sin I produce, grace is going to be bigger. So why don't I just you know, relax, take it easy? The answer, of course, is that something took place historically. That's why I call it a historical answer. The answer to this question is that something took place at a point in your life that has changed not only the direction of your life, but the attitude that you have towards sin. So to think that one could take advantage of God's grace, as the question suggests here in verse one, is the way that you used to think about such things. But something happened and you don't think like that anymore. And so he's going to answer why you don't think like that anymore in verses two and three. Whoops, there we go. He says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? So he begins the answer by saying you, you can't purposefully and easily enjoy sin anymore after you have, after you have died to sin. Now dying to sin is an expression he's using Dying to sin involves several kinds of death. All right. For example, it involves the death of ignorance to the reality of sin. You cannot enjoy sin anymore because you know what sin does and you know the plan of salvation. In other words, you know too much now in order to simply dive into sin and enjoy it without any repercussions. So that's the death of ignorance. You're not ignorant anymore. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. You know what God requires of you. You know what God has done to save you. And having that kind of knowledge you know, mm, spoils, if you wish, spoils your effort to just enjoy sin without consequences. Then there's the, the death of enjoyment of sin. You know, uh, you have the knowledge of the gospel. You know that God is present. This is why people are reluctant to hear the gospel or talk about the Bible. It'll ruin their appetite for sin. Number one reason, you want to share the gospel with somebody, you want to talk about religious things, or you want to share your faith with that person, and, and they're like, oof. It's not that they're afraid of a theological discussion. It's not that they're you know, so ignorant that they can't you know, absorb some sort of information about religious ideas. Because many times they'll gladly and curiously talk about Hinduism. What about Hinduism? You know, what, about, you know, what about Islam? Or what about Buddhism? You know, natural curiosity about those kind of Eastern religions. But they put the brakes on if you actually try to have a serious conversation about Christianity. Why? Because people, they know intuitively that the minute you begin talking about Christianity, you're going to have to talk about sin, <laughs> their sin. And at some point, dealing with their sin. And people don't, they don't even want to go down that road.
Then there's the death of the old life. You know, attitudes, actions that we put to death in the waters of baptism. You know, when Paul is saying you were baptized into, it means you were baptized into, means into a relationship with Christ. Those who are baptized into Christ is a way of saying you now have a connection with Christ established through your baptism. It can also mean a baptism motivated by and in relationship to what Jesus said and what He did and what He promised. And it also means, as Paul says, a baptism into or in relationship to His death. His death secures a payment for our sins. It purchases atonement to God for our imperfection. Baptism is the action that plugs us into the power generated by Jesus' death. Baptism is what plugs us into the power of, of grace. So at baptism, God puts Christ between us and our old lives. This is why we can't enjoy it like we used to enjoy it when we were sinners, when we were oblivious to Christ. Now Christ, He's in the way. It's like your mother going with you on your first date. <laughs> you know, you're not going to try anything. You're not, you know, you're my mom there, right? Or if your mom is there when all your buddies come over and you're, you guys are down in the playroom you know, watching, playing video games and your mom says, oh, I like video games too. You know, and she, can I play? You know, and yeah, sure mom, you know, but you know, the, the boys are not going to be talking about what the boys are talking about, right? Why? Well, my mom is there. I mean, that's not a perfect example, obviously, but it's like that. Christ is there. I said at one point, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And based on that confession, I was buried in the waters of baptism. And all the things I just talked about, you know, plugged into grace, put into Christ, received forgiveness, all that stuff happened there. And because of that, I, I can't just go back to my old life and live it like I used to. So it's the death of my old life. Also, he says it's the, it's the death of the rule of sin over us. In verses four and five, he says, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his uh, resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. So that's the other death, the death of the rule of sin over us. And that death brings us freedom. So before Christ, we are ruled by our passions and our lusts, you know, for money, for sex, power, enjoyment, consumption, control, fame, whatever. Something you know, is making us do what we do. And what is that thing? Well, it's a sin. Paul says that when our death to sin occurs in baptism, it signals the death of the rule of sin over us and the beginning of a new life and actually the beginning of a new rulership over us. A rulership where sin is no longer the ruler, but Christ, He's the ruler now. He's the ruler. So in baptism, the rule of sin is broken by Christ. And it's broken in four ways. First, we receive forgiveness and this unburdens our conscience. You know, uh, Peter says in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. 
And in 1 Peter 3.21, Peter talks about uh, baptism is an appeal to God for a clear conscience. That's a, that's a marvelous thing to have a clear conscience that our sins are forgiven. The relief that that brings is that uh, uh, if, if our sins have been forgiven, we no longer dread the judgment. Right? What does the Hebrew writer says? It is given to man to live once and then what happens? And then comes the judgment. So whenever people think about death, intuitively they also think about judgment. The beauty of the gospel is that God announces our forgiveness for all of our sins. Forgiveness of sins means I'm no longer condemned at judgment. It doesn't mean I'm perfect, it just means I'm forgiven. So that, that's a tremendous relief. So the rule of sin is broken because you know, sin was always drawing me in and always making me condemned before God. Now I'm forgiven. Number two, the rule of sin is broken because we enter into a relationship with God where He considers us with mercy instead of uh, judgment. And this relieves our fear. We are now righteous before God. We can go before Him. The rule of sin is broken in a third way. We receive the presence of the Holy Spirit within us who enables us to pray and resist the temptation that once overcame us. You know, what does Paul say? If, he, he, if the one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, he'll do the same thing for you that he did for Jesus. We'll be talking about that in my, in my sermon today, Romans 8, 13. You know, we have the power as Christians now where we control the sin that is in us and it isn't the other way around. Before, it's the sin that controlled me. Now I control the sin. I can't eliminate all of it, but I'm in control of it. I know what it is. I know what to do. I win more battles than I lose. I improve. I'm no longer out of control. I'm in control. And then the rule of sin is broken by Christ in the sense that we enter into a fellowship with other believers called the church. And this fellowship gives us comfort and courage when we are weak and when we fail. Why, why, do, we, why do we come to church? Why do we come to listen to Bible lessons and you know, participate in the various activities? Because this strengthens our faith, that's why. We're not, we're not ticking off brownie points. We're not coming to church to please God because we attended. It's like going to the gym, right? You don't go to the gym. <laughs> Imagine you go to the gym and they have a little you know, check, check off you know, that you were at the gym. So you go to the gym and you just sign in and check off that you arrived at nine o'clock and then you have coffee and a Danish at the gym and then you go home. And you say, well, I went to the gym and I go to the gym three times a week. Yes. But if that's what you do at the gym, right? Well, why do you go to the gym for? Well, you go to work out. Strengthen, tone, lose weight, whatever. You know, that's why you go to the gym. Well, that's why you come to church. You don't come to church you know, to check off. Well, I've been to church. That's not why we go to church. We go to church. It's a gym. It's a spiritual gym. We work out spiritually. We learn, we teach, we share, we work, we serve, we praise, we pray, we adore. You know, spiritual exercise, what we do here. It's not the only place we do it. This is where we do it corporately. Just like if you work out, you might go to the gym a couple of times a week. Doesn't mean you do nothing else. Maybe you, when you're at home, you stretch, you know, or maybe you take a run after work. You know. It's the same thing. This isn't the only spiritual exercise, it's the corporate one. That's the importance of the church. And why do we do that? Well, you go to the gym because you want to you know, maintain the best health possible. 
and exercise is a component of that. Why do we go to church? We want to keep the best spiritual health possible. And public assembly is one element in that equation. And so Paul is saying sin cannot rule over a person who has a clear conscience, a person who is forgiven for his sins and that forgiveness is continually available to him, a person who now has the ability to resist the drawing power of sin. As a Christian, I know what sin is. Oh, 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 I see. I call it the snake. Oh, the snake's in the grass. I heard him. I know oh, this situation right here. I see where this is going. You know, I mean, I'm aware. I'll use my gym thing again. You know, you're at the, you're at uh, Panera Bread you know, and you've been to the gym and blah, 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 and you see you know, scones, you know, 4,000 calories. <laughs> I believe I'll have the lemon bread, thank you. <laughs> you kind of know, you're aware. Well, spiritually, you know, you're aware. You know? A friend at work says, hey, you know, I'm getting married. You don't have my bachelor party. We're having it at uh, you know, the X club. You know, and it'll be women and boy, we're going to have fun and it's an open bar and blah, blah, blah. If you're a Christian, a little light should be going on there <laughs> saying, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's not. Maybe that's 4,000 calories. You know? You know, I, hey, congratulations and I hope this is great. Not something I, you know, I, I believe I'll pass on the, on the thing, but you know, be happy to attend the wedding and encourage you guys. You know, the little light goes on. When I was enthralled by sin, it was like, all right, can I get there early? And then he mentions another death. Remember we talked about the different death. The number four was the death of the rule of sin over us. And I've just talked about that. Well, there's another death and that is the death of death. <laughs> the death of death. If sin no longer rules, then death is defeated because death is the result of sin. It is the punishment for those who are found guilty of sin. When one is pardoned for sin, then the punishment is excused. So here we speak of the death or the suffering of the soul for eternity. You know when I say, or when Paul says the death of death, he's talking about spiritual death. So let's read verse eight and nine, what he says. Now, if we have died with Christ, remember dying with Christ, that's the baptism, that's how we die with Christ. Okay. So he says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death it no longer is master over him. So, uh, Paul is saying, if our death is like Christ, in other words, in baptism we die, then he says, our resurrection will also resemble Christ's in that it will be to an eternal life because death will no longer be present. I mean, we're going to suffer physical death now because our bodies are, you know, are full of sin. But after resurrection, our glorified bodies will have no sin and no death will ever face us. He goes on to explain, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. In other words, you know, he paid the price for all of our sins and he did that just once. No need to do that again. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So he died for our sins, but the life he lives, he lives in relationship to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So here he summarizes the matter. The death that Christ died, he died in relationship to sin, as I mentioned before. And he did this because he became involved in our sins by taking the responsibility for them. Death had a claim on him because of that and he experienced it. You know, remember I said the law of sin and death, if you sin, you die. Well, Jesus never sinned, but he took on our sins. And because he took our sins on him, he was then subject to that core spiritual law. You got sin, you die, and he did. Once he did so, however, his experience with death is now over. 
His resurrection no longer relates him to our sins because our sins are left in the grave. His existence now is totally in relationship to God. He is at the right hand of God. Well, in the same way, Paul says, those who have ended their relationship with sin in baptism should leave sin and the desire for it in the grave and be totally focused on God like Jesus is. In other words, Jesus left our sins on the cross. We leave our, we leave our, we leave our sins in the water. Jesus rose from the dead. We too will rise from the dead. And I think the implicit point here, kind of between the lines, is that we have to live, you know, after our baptism, after we become Christian, we have to live like resurrected people live. You know, he's saying, how can you go back to sin? You're a resurrected person. You have a new life. That's your old life. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to go back to that? So remember, the original question was, why not continue to sin in order to generate more grace, since grace increases to cover larger and larger sins? And the answer to that question is, we do not sin to provoke grace because our attitude and relationship towards sin has changed since our baptism. We just don't do that anymore. Now before baptism, sin was the boss and it led us to all forms of disobedience and impurity. When we were baptized, we died to sin, you know, died to ignorance of sin and lust for sin and the old life and the rule of sin over us and the death that sin brought into it. You know, all of this, we died to that stuff. And with this death, sin ceased to rule over us. Remember, not its presence in us, but its importance to us. I still sin and I still see sin as a Christian, but it certainly does not have the power that it used to have over me. Now in later chapters, Paul will, uh, we're going to find out that we can increase the influence of grace over ourselves and others, but it isn't by increasing our sins. This type of thinking is a result of a sinful and darkened mind in the first place. Finish up the passage here in verses 12 to 14. So he kind of summarizes. He says, therefore, <clears throat> do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin, meaning don't put yourself, you know, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. OK, about that bachelor party, I'll just go for like a half hour. <laughs> just get a little taste, you know, just half hour. Have one beer, that's it. That's presenting your members. <laughs> you know, you, that's that's kind of say, here, here I am, take me. Take your best shot, sin. That's what, that's what he means. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of righteousness. Don't do that. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members, that's your body, your mind, your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So based on his answer to the question in verses 12 to 14, Paul encourages them to be aggressive in dealing with their sins. But to do so, they have to willingly submit to God and His will for their lives. So instead of just you know, laying back and let grace cover your sins because it's bigger than your sin. He said, no, that, that's the old way of thinking. The new way of thinking is you, you don't lean back, you lean in. You lean in. You become aggressive with you know, dealing with your sin. You know, if, if pornography is your sin, aggressively dealing with it is clearing out all the junk. Burning the hard drive, uh, 
uh, uh, getting rid of the magazines, uh, dumping the video, you know, burning all of it. That's, that's leaning in. You ever see movies about people who you know, are serious alcoholics or something like that? You know, there's always a scene where the wife or, or if she's the one, the husband, they're going through the house and what are they looking for? They're looking for where all the booze is hidden under the sink and inside the toilet bowl thing, you know, the, the, you know, whatever, the water closet you know, and in the garage. And you know, they get rid of all the things. Or if you're a smoker, you know, get rid of all the just in case cigarette. You know, lean in. That's what he's saying. Get aggressive with it. Before you were a Christian, getting aggressive with it wasn't helping you much because you didn't have the power to deal with it. You didn't have the gospel, didn't have the spirit, you didn't have a clear mind. But now you've got all of this on your side, so get aggressive. That's the attitude. And yes, you may fail. Yes, you may fail. And when we do, the grace of God is there. So I want to tackle it because I know even if I you know, fail from here, God will help me. It's always the same idea. I, don't, I, I strive to be perfect. I strive to be perfect, I do. There's nothing wrong with that. I strive to do things the way God wants me to do. But I always have the comfort of knowing that I'm not judged by that. I'm judged because I have faith. And you know, it just keeps going around. My faith pushes me to strive. And as I grow in Christ, I gain confidence. And as I gain confidence, I push harder to strive. The grace of God working in me. All right, so next time we're going to look at the second answer. Remember I said he asked this question twice? He's going to ask the question again in verse 15. And he's going to give a whole other answer to it uh, in the following verses. And that should finish that particular section. So that's it for this time. I don't want to begin that because it'll be too long. We'll run out of time before I can do it. All right. So that's our class for this week. Thank you very much for your attention.